Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dead to Me, the only Walking Dead podcast with the guts to start at season 10. I'm your host, Johnny O'Dell. I'm the social media manager for The Walking Dead. And with me this week, as always, Alexandra August. She is our podcast producer. We are without the wonderfully and wickedly talented Woody Tondorf because he is on paternity leave. He's probably not breastfeeding. He's, I th- I heard he was breastfeeding, but maybe it, maybe I know it, he wanted to. Yeah. Well, maybe the baby's not latching. All right. So, uh, if you guys don't know, we are doing this thing called talk dead me reanimated since we are in a suspended time period where we don't know where the show's going to come back. We are rewatching old iconic episodes and talking to some old cast members. Uh, this week we are covering one of the greatest, episodes of the walking dead to date season five episode one called no sanctuary uh this is obviously the escape from terminus episode uh directed by greg nicotero written by scott m gimple and our guest this week is going to be andrew j west he played gareth and i am so excited uh alexandra what else can people look forward to this episode well, in today's woody list episode, you can look forward to a little bit of tears from both Johnny and myself. So we miss our co-host and wish him well. Uh, then we're going to head into winners and losers, um, apocalypse, stray arrows, and we'll have a new surprise segment called Yelp Review. Oh, I wonder what that's about. I know, right? Pins and needles. You guys can also find us on all major uh, podcast platforms. Obviously, you're listening to us now. But if you're listening to us on YouTube, hey. Why don't you uh, pick up that Spotify, the old iTunes, subscribe to us there. It'll it'll warm our hearts, and it'll probably make Woody come back to uh, the podcast even faster. And if you the thing like if you if you're listening to us on a podcast app, you can like walk around your house. You could maybe maybe go for a little stroll, Rooney outside. If you watch us on YouTube and you. And you walk when you watch outside, your little stroll Rooney might take you into oncoming traffic. So we suggest YouTube for home, yep. podcast apps for for walking around. Yeah, unless you're protesting or getting groceries, please don't leave your house. This pandemic is still happening, guys. Um, All right. Without further ado, we're going to get into winners and losers. And now that Woody's not here, I'll do the theme song and it will be much a lot more sad. Some people are winning, some people are losing, but there's the walking dead. So everyone turns. Yeah, that was good. But it makes me sad. It's like we're eulogizing um, Woody, who is, you know, now that he's a parent, essentially dead, you know. I'm really jealous of his kid because he gets to just shit and sleep whenever he wants. No, because he gets to all, he gets all the Woody time he wants. But yeah, also that I mean, well, he does get a lot of Woody time. All right, so no sanctuary. Half our heroes are stuck in terminus, looking pretty grim, and Carol, Tyrese, and a few others have to come and save the day. It gets so crazy this episode. Rewatching it, I forget how like just like on pins and needles you are the entire time so um i can get why also too just like if you think about season four was a doozy yeah season four is like the back half of season four is just you we honestly like at this point plot armor didn't exist like i think that rick and carl were pretty much safe i remember watching this but everybody else was completely expendable during that time no one knew where anyone was it was this very it was it was honestly stressful to watch as a viewer which is just a testament to how well executed it was and then when they finally meet up with each other and they come into like cannibal country you're just like oh guys Ooh, cannibal country that sounds like a show on like <laughs> fx or something my winner this week is resourcefulness. It's the tool that they use to break everyone out. I mean, we see Carol take fireworks, some guts, and a poncho, and she essentially frees all of her friends who are either trapped in a train car or at this murder mm. trough, which is horrifying. Oof. Well, and freeze them with flare. There's a big explosion. It's fancy. Literal flare, yes. And they have to use manipulation. And, I mean, Carol is the most resourceful in this episode. I mean, her little almost like one-on-one confrontation with uh, Mary, kind of like a Dolores Maeve confrontation from Westworld. Mm. Uh, but instead, she just, you know, just kicks her down and she uh, she gets the uh, walkers to come in and consume her. And Rick with like, like Rick in the, in the, car, in the train car with his little, his little like handy piece of wood that he uses to both free mm. himself and which I think is pretty optimistic yes. given, given the power of wood against plastic, but I'm not mad at it. I'm glad Rick got free and I'm glad he managed to kill some people and get a- Oh, you said wood. <laughs> Woody, we, we miss you. We? <laughs> We're little babies. <laughs> <laughs> Can we move in? <laughs> Who's your winner? Uh, my winner this week is probably somewhat predictable given my my, my fan fan patterns. Uh, my winner this week is Carol, oh, obviously. Yes. 
Carol was just about she does it does not matter if Carol is on the outs with people she is very loyal and she will make sure that those people do not die or she'll do her best despite the fact that they've ex- exiled her yeah people people remember the you know her like breaking everyone out of terminus but since it's been so long they might forget the context at this point Carol was definitely exiled from Persona the group Nangata. after murdering Karen and David yeah. I mean yeah Rick sent her away and uh, she had to go through the grove and survive with Tyrese and Judith and uh, you know completely redeemed yep. herself yep again with flair and then also the uh carol shippers because when carol does come back Whoa. and like see the group dare i mean this is just a classic i love you run just runs up to her slams her body slams her with a hug lifts her up that hug goes on for a while they feel like feels like they're gonna make out maybe um yeah so carol shippers i would imagine this is a very popular gif for them it is. It is a Mount Rushmore Carol moment for sure. And even like after he hugs mm-hmm. her and then she's like kind of catching up with everybody, you can see Daryl just feet away, still like sobbing almost because he is so he's so overwhelmed happy. with emotion that she's back. And, you know, he probably thought the worst that he or at least that he would never see her again. And yeah. it's just it must have been very he just lost Beth like two episodes ago. I know. I know. Um, also, low key winner, Judith. I mean, how has Judith outlived all these people like Mika and Lizzie? And like, <laughs> I mean, she is just like the little Yoda on Luke's back with Tyrese. I mean, she is just surviving. Uh, you know, someone puts a knife to her and she just survives it all. How I mean, Gabriel hasn't turned her into a messiah or hasn't like wrapped his delusion, his remaining delusion around Judith and her survival is beyond me because right. you are exactly right. Just just the fact that she survives this particular episode is impressive. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine like when Tyrese went crazy when Judith was threatened by Martin, I, I assume that's how Woody's, uh, you know, keeping the same energy with his kid. I would imagine mm-hmm. that he would just mm-hmm. rage kill people in and around a cabin. We're going to find out. We're going to find I out. Mean... I'm going to keep count of the bodies. All right. Now we're <laughs> going to go on to losers. Uh, my loser this week is anyone who fucks with Rick. Accurate. Very accurate. Don't mess with Rick. Uh, Rick and Michonne both have a really handy way of, you know, kind of calling dibs on when they're going to kill someone. They're like, not now, <laughs> not tomorrow. But someday I will kill you. Like, and he does every time. The only one he hasn't done that with is Negan yet, but he, he slit his throat. So he basically almost fulfilled that promise. But Rick, 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 for all intents and purposes, killed the Negan he didn't like. Right. A new Negan was born that day. That's true. That's true. He did kill old Negan. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, he eventually kills Gareth that we see, you know, in Four Walls and a Roof. He, he m- murders all the people who were about to bludgeon him with a bat and slit his throat such a I, it is kind of nice that they bludgeon him with a bat so you're like you can experience less of the throat slitting but like very ominous by the way where they're like holding the bat up several times behind glenn i mean that is foreshadowing yep. if i've ever seen it oh yeah that was actually one of my one of my straight arrows was the foreshadowing of that the foreshadowing of that moment because i as a as um, a non-comics reader on my first round watching this that that just brushed over me completely, as I'm sure it did for a lot of the Walking Dead viewers um, who who had not been exposed to the comics before. And it's been really interesting now with a somewhat graduated familiarity with the source material, watching this back and being like, oh, that's cool. Right. Who is your loser this week? My loser this week were uh, Star Trek The Next Generation fans because oh, I felt Christ. this... Drink. I felt this. <laughs> um, so yeah, TNG fans. I remember the first time I watched this episode, I felt the same way as I did just recently when I rewatched it, it which is that if you're going to have Denise Crosby on your show, use Denise Crosby. Mary is in this for like five minutes and she's bonkers. She's like very memorable for that Ooh, those yeah. five minutes, which just means that you should have used more of her. I could have done with a little less Gareth and a little more to actually cut that out because Andrew G. West is on, our sh- is on the show this week. I could have done with a little less Judith and a little more Mary. That's just me. All right, now we are going to go into a brand new segment, which I hope we continue, called Yelp Review. Not sponsored by Yelp, but could be. Go ahead, give it, throw us some Should cash, be. Yelp. For now, we are going to take a fun location from The Walking Dead and try to give it a Yelp review as if we were just a visitor. We are not Rick, we're not any of the characters, we are just some random stranger that happens upon this place and then is somehow able to give it a Yelp review. Don't 
Yeah, I know. There's no internet in the apocalypse. Just don't think about it too hard, okay, guys? It's just it's- look, look. There's going to be internet fucking somewhere in the apocalypse, and if there's internet somewhere in the apocalypse, there are going to be people venting their frustrations on it. Okay? It's true. Alexander, why don't you start us off with your Yelp review of Terminus? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Ugh. If I could give this place zero stars, I would. We haven't even got sat yet, and I'm already writing this review. First of all, the waiting room is an unair conditioned shipping container, and there aren't any like benches or anything. I asked for water like 36 hours ago. I mean, like, I get that we're in an apocalypse, but what if I was an elderly person? Speaking of which, my grandma was supposed to meet us here, but she's running late, and I can't find anyone to tell to keep an eye out for her. She's 84 and lost her glasses, so she needs help, but like, no one is responding when I knock on the door. WTF. Honestly, there's so much screaming all the time, they probably just can't hear me, but that means that you should assign each shipping container a host. Duh. Anyway, the gift shop is stacked and the barbecue smells great, but we've literally been waiting for three days and there's just no excuse for this kind of service at a place calling itself a sanctuary. Terminus? More like termina. One out of five stars. <laughs> that is, that is, a, I hope you're all standing wherever you are listening to this and giving a round of applause. <laughs> that was, that was amazing. That, that is excellent comedy writing and that is um, very apropos. I love it. I, we are, we are Thank never you. getting rid of the segment, even if it does not pertain <laughs> to the episode. All right. So my Yelp review for Terminus. Love the open concept and exposed brick, but I don't remember seeing slaughter troughs and smelly train cars on their initial listing. The lady who greeted us, Mary, made pretty good barbecue, but my wife found a literal human shoulder in our pulled pork. (gasps) I'm all for trying new things, but this seemed a little excessive. Also, her friend Gareth kept licking his lips every time I complimented my wife's legs. Not cool, dude. Well, at least they had fireworks. Three out of five stars. (laughs) The fireworks is my favorite. (laughs) And that has been Yelp Reviews. All right, so now we're going to go on to another fun segment called Apocatips, which has its own copyright-free music, we think. Cue the music! In a zombie apocalypse, if you find yourself in a throat-slitting lineup, make sure to stay at the end. It gives you plenty of time for your captors to get distracted with stupid stuff and possible explosions that gives you enough time to escape. I'm just saying, if you're in that lineup, you may not have a lot of choices, but if you're like, hey, can I just be at the end? I just, you know, I kind of have a thing for this and I want to see everyone else die. Like, you know, get on their you side You want to be last within. picked for this team. Yeah, yeah I want to be the last one picked. Please, please. Sometimes a way to go about that is, is to, like, ask to be up front, and if they're dicks, then they'll put you on the end. Reverse psychology. Ooh, reverse psychology. That is another tip. Alexandra, what is your apocatip? My apocatip this week should be kind of a no-brainer, but hey, I hey, mean... Hey, like, haha, no-brainer because of the zombies. <laughs> uh, 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 so yeah, don't threaten a baby if the guy in charge of that baby is bigger than you are. Much bigger. It's if he looks base, like the guy from yeah. The Wire, don't threaten that baby. Don't threaten that baby. I mean, in general, don't threaten babies. It usually doesn't work out. Uh... But yeah, especially, especially if, if there's a guy who looks like the guy from The Wire. That's just, yeah, I mean, like, you know, that feel that definitely feels like something that's obvious, but, you know, it wouldn't be an apocalypse if somebody didn't already make that mistake. And somebody made that mistake this week, so. They really did. We care uh, about you. That's what, why. What a delicious way for Tyrese to snap out of his <gasps> Morgan zone of not killing. Delicious. And just to, like, literally just rage kill everyone. I mean, he goes full, he goes from zero to Kratos, kills, and then we don't exactly see what he does outside until the end where we just see, like, all these dead walkers, and then one's just and straight one up just impaled chilling on, on a, a spike. <laughs> it's like, holy this, shit! You can tell this is a Greg Nicotero episode, because there were so many wonderful, gratuitous shots of blood and gore. Like, yeah. Alright, and that wraps up Apocatips. Guys, make sure to write all the Apocatips down every week. This is useful information. If this pandemic gets worse, you are going to need tips and tricks, especially as Walking Dead fans, to survive. So, Mm -hmm. write these down. Alright, so now we're going to get on to our guest. He played Gareth on The Walking Dead, and he's been in a million other things. I had so much fun talking to him and getting his perspective. Turns out, not a cannibal in real life. Did not know that. Ah! I know, very disappointing. But, um, alright, so... Take it away, past me. All right. Our guest this week is the fantastic actor who played everyone's favorite cannibal, Gareth, on The Walking Dead. Since then, you also know him from Under the Dome, Dead Summer, and of course, Once Upon a Time, Andrew J. West. What's up, man? Thank you so much for coming on to Talk Dead to Me. 
Hey, hey, thank you for having me. Great to be with you today. Absolutely. Um, how are you doing in quarantine? Oh man, I'm hanging in there. You know, I got a, uh, I got a 19 month old daughter. So this is like, there is no such thing as boredom. It is, it is a, it is a constant, uh, I'm engaged constantly. So I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in there. How about you? Wow, that, yeah, I'm doing great. Um, I don't have a 19 month old daughter, but I imagine it, does that make parenting harder or easier now that you're home all the time? You know, I've kind of come to realize that uh, our daughter's age is like the perfect age for a pandemic. It's like quarantine proof age because we don't have to worry about the homeschooling. We don't have to, you know, and I I really feel for a lot of my friends who have older kids because they have to, you know, sit their kids down and say, look, this is why you can't, you know, play with your friends. This is why you can't go to school. We don't have that. We just have a little wonderful cute maniac running around like who just wants to play with mommy and daddy all day so so it uh it kind of works out but uh wow yeah that's no it's cool. good it's good we've, we've been busy that's yeah. great quarantine age that's probably going to be the name of a movie that comes out after <laughs> know, this whole right? thing is over i already am getting like um i i, I was approached about like a coronavirus show i don't want to i i don't think i'm allowed to like really talk about about it a whole lot but yeah the, it, the, this stuff is already in the works they're already wow trying to make this happen in different ways. Yeah, it's crazy. That's, uh, it's, it's gonna look a little different for the next uh, year or more. Yeah, it, absolutely. Um, so let's start at the beginning, the yeah. very beginning. Uh, you are from Indiana, um, from mm-hmm. Merrillville. Is that, am I saying that right? That you are saying it, more or less correct. Merrillville is what, is what we say back home. We kind of drop those. There's so many L's, you know, you gotta get rid of some of them, drop a few of them. Uh, but yeah, I was born in Merrillville. I, I grew up in Lake Station. Uh, the region, as as the, uh, the 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 general area is known, uh, but yeah, that's my that's my hometown. That's great. So you you actually weren't into acting until you got to college, right? Yeah, I was absolutely terrified of the idea of like getting up and performing in front of people through most of through all my childhood, definitely through through high school. Um, it was just it was like something I always wanted to do, but I was I was just like, there's just no way because I'll have an aneurysm or I'll I'll just you know pass out or something if I if I actually like stood up and tried to do that in front of people. So I it wasn't until college, um, I think I was about nineteen or twenty, and I and I. Um, decided, you know, what the hell, I'm gonna sign up for an acting class. And, uh, and then that was sort of it. I was a philosophy major. I was, I, was do, I was taking like philosophy and anthropology courses. And I thought, you know, I'd probably just, I don't know, maybe like stay in academia or something. I didn't really know. And then I took that class and it, it kind of changed everything. And then, you know, two, three years after that, I was, uh, I was in LA already. Wow, so yeah. you probably got a manager pretty quickly then. I got lucky, man. I, di- I did. I did. I, I, I was in town, I think, for, um, I don't know, maybe six, seven months. And then I and then that's what happened. I, I met a manager who, who agreed to rep this very green, you know, 22 year old with no credits, not in the union or anything. I still work with them to this day. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, started kind of kind of hitting the pavement and doing the doing the thing, getting in to auditions. It took a lot. I mean, I auditioned for I don't, probably a year and a half, I think, before, you know, I, I got anything. But yeah, it, it all, I, I was lucky and I was able to get into those rooms quickly when I first, when I first moved to LA. Right. Um, what did your family and friends think about you moving to LA and, you know, choosing that career path? Because usually, especially from like the Midwest, I'm from Ohio, you know, people can be kind oh, of yeah. wary of that sort of thing. A fellow Midwesterner, yeah. So you know yes. how they, uh, you know how they feel about this kind of, you know, they, they kind of, I, I didn't get like, um, I can't say anybody was, was in, in my family or anything else was like totally unsupportive of it. But you, you get that look, you know, you, you, you tell people like, oh yeah, I'm going to move to Los Angeles and become an actor. And, and they sort of look at you like maybe you're not feeling so well or maybe you need to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you need to be committed or something. Um, because it's just, you know, look, I mean, like where I grew up, it's just not something that anybody does, you know? It's not, uh, it's, it's, I, everybody in my family and in the area that I'm from, it was a lot of steel workers. You know, you work at the mill um, and, you know, everybody, people tend to stay local. And not everybody, of course, but like, right. you know, that's sort of the life and it's, and it's a great life. Um, but that's, there's, 
that's sort of the expectation in a lot of ways, I guess. So um, yeah, it was, I, I have to say I can't, my, my family was supportive, um, but you know, even my grandmother who, who raised me was always like, oh yeah, you'll, uh, you're gonna move to California, that's great. Uh, you know, you're gonna have some fun out there and then uh, you know, you can go to law school in a couple of years or you know, you could take a couple of years off and like audition and then you'll go to med school or whatever. You know, I think that was what she thought would happen. But uh, who knows, maybe it still will, will but uh, here we are 14 years later and I haven't, I haven't filled out that uh, law school application yet, but you never Good know. For you, proving them wrong, have, have they finally gotten off your back about it? <laughs> yeah, finally. Yeah, it took, I think it took The Walking Dead actually before anyone was like, was like all right. It, it took me, as you said, everyone's favorite cannibal before people were like, all right, maybe this will, uh, you know, maybe this isn't, so, it wasn't such a bad decision for you. Right. Um, well, you also, I mean, you, people were, I mean, you are a very memorable villain in The Walking Dead. We'll get into that in just a second. Um, but, and you only, you had a pretty short arc, but you're still regarded as one of the top villains of the series. I mean, you have Shane, the governor, you, Negan, Alpha. I mean, that's kind of like, you're right up there. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and I, you know, I had no idea what to expect when I, when I got this job, because as, as you know, they're, you know, it's all very secretive when you, when you're auditioning for the show. And when you first start working on the show, actors usually don't really know, you know, what they're in store for. Um, but I certainly never expected for it to have this sort of tail that it's, that it's had in, in this life. And, and honestly, when I got the job, I didn't know if it would be one episode or if it would be, you know, seasons. I, I just had no clue, you know, so it turned out to be, yeah, four, like you said, which was very brief. Um, still, I, you know, I was thrilled to, I would have done one line on the show, but um, yeah, for it to kind of, you know, last the way that it did and, and have the impact um, is, is amazing. But, you know, it was also a testament to how well that was written. And man, those, those um, you know, that arc, which is, which is pulled directly from the comic book and changed a little bit, obviously, the Hunter's arc. Right was such a memorable, awesome arc in the comic too, you know? So it's like all, all of those components, I think had to come together to make it what it was, to make the character of Gareth what it was, to make that arc memorable in the way that it was, you know, so. Right, and before we, pardon the pun, bite into Gareth's um, story, I'm so sorry, I had to. Um, I'll never get away from it, it's fine. You'll never get away from, hey, no, listen, you had a huge arc on Once Upon a Time. I mean, you know, you don't have to just be a cannibal the rest of your life, it's okay. You know, I, I still um, think uh, everyone's favorite cannibal is what'll be, uh, is, that'll be my epitaph. That, I, I <laughs> oh no. Uh, well, um, well, let's go back to, uh, so you're in Los Angeles and you know, you're 22, you get a manager pretty early, what are the first roles you get? And then how does that eventually lead you to Walking Dead? Oh, man, that's a good question. <laughs> it, was a, it was a meandering path. Well, look, I'll tell you, you know, the first job that I, the first acting job that I ever got paid for was a Kenny Chesney music video. Um, and this was actually pre-LA. Oh, yeah, this was, uh, this was in Indiana. So I was, um, you know, like I said, I took that acting class and then I was getting more and more excited about acting. And then this opportunity popped up to go to this, like, uh, like cattle call casting in Cincinnati. I drove like five hours from Indiana to go to this casting room. I was for this Kenny Chesney music video. And I, and I got the part and I think they paid me like a hundred bucks or something. And it, it was so exciting. And, and I, but you know, there was something that was sort of confident, confidence building about that because it, it was, it was sort of another thing. I was like, well, actually, you know, I went in and booked a job. Maybe this is you know, something I should be doing. So of course, that's all it takes. Kenny Chesney music video, then hop in a car to go to LA. And, you know, it, it all, it all uh, adds up. But so I guess that was the first step on the meandering path. Um, but you know, I started doing, I, I just started doing guest spots and co-stars on shows. Uh, the first, uh, the first co-star that I ever did was on the CW show called Privileged. Um, and you know, I was just sort of doing the, doing the actor thing. I, I did a, I did a couple uh, pilots that never went and, you know, I, was, I did a couple arcs on, on different shows. I, I had a, I had an arc on a, um, an ABC family show called Greek. Uh, it was actually where I met my wife, but that was my longest, you know, I think I ended up doing like 12 episodes as a guest star. And so that was like oh, yeah. the longest job at the point, but I was just bouncing around, you know, and, and then I, um, I met um, uh, Sharon and Sherry, the, the casting directors for The Walking Dead, uh, early on, and I had auditioned for them for a few things, and they were fans, and 
you know, they, they brought me in for this role and they said, look, we, we think you'd be really good for this. We can't tell you much about what it is. This is, this is Gareth, but you know, we've got, uh, we've got this little monologue that you'll do and, and um, you know, we'll see what happens. So I just went in and read for them and it was not, it was like not the uh, material from the episodes. It was, it was like written specifically for the audition. So went in and did the thing and kind of forgot about it. Like you try to, when you walk out of these auditions and you know, I think four days later or something, I got a call saying that I had a flight booked to Atlanta and I had no idea, like, again, who I'd be playing or what. And then I'm, and then I, I show up to, to the studios in Atlanta and they're doing fittings and stuff and they're trying on like all these different, they had like, uh, like a full like camo outfit they put me in and all this different stuff. Cause I think they were still trying to figure out what they wanted the character to be. And meanwhile, I hadn't even seen a script or anything. And I was like, it's trying to guess like who I'd be based on these clothes that they're putting me in. And then after that, um, Scott Gimple called me into his office and uh, we sat down and he kind of gave me, you know, he told me what would be happening essentially. And that, and that was when, in, 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 in hearing what the character was going to be and sort of realizing, I think that was the first, my first sense of, oh, this might actually be something really, you know, like we were saying, like kind of memorable and kind of cool, just, just the way that it was written and the way that it would be uh, presented on, you know, in the show. Well, first of all, were you a fan of the show or had you watched the show at all beforehand yes. or did you catch um, up? I was a fan of the show and I got to say, and I still feel this way, the, the pilot of The Walking Dead is one of the best pilots I've ever seen of a television show. I, I remember when the show came out and, uh, you know, I sat down and watched that pilot and I was just absolutely blown away. And I rewatched it several times over the years and... Um, it's absolutely remarkable, you know? So yeah, it hooked me. Uh, it, for me, it was always tough to keep up with any show. So I was always sort of like falling way behind and then I have to like catch back up and, you know, but yeah, I was, I was a fan of the show and I was aware of the show. I hadn't actually read the comic when I got the job, but as soon as I got the job, I went and, you know, read the comic. Um, I'm not current on the comic now, but I, but I went and read through the whole thing and I read the Hunter's arc and, and then, and then it, it just sort of gave me a wider, you know, perspective on what this world was, what this character, the source material for this character. And, and uh, it was, you know, that was all helpful. And then that was another piece of the puzzle. And it was another moment for me to be like, wow, this is going to be awesome, <laughs> you know? So, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I watched the pilot recently and I love that the first scene is just Rick shooting a little girl in the face, like oh, in yeah. bunny slippers. And you're like, oh, it's this show. Okay. Yes. Yes. And it's like, if you can't deal with this first scene, you are not going to like the show. And Absolutely. people who are like, hell yes, they keep watching. It pulled no punches and it just, it just went for it. And, I, and it's just so rare, you know, like a lot of times pilots especially will play it a little safe because, the, you know, nobody knows they're trying to, first they're trying to impress the, 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 the network and the studio to try to get the thing on the air. And then they're trying to attract an audience and they, they can sort of be a little lowest common denominator with it sometimes before they really find their voice, you know, any, any show, but this one especially just didn't, uh, you know, it just, it, like you said, it just told you what it was and what it was all about and it went for it, you know, it so yeah. cool. One of the things I really like about your character, Gareth, is that he wasn't as like power hungry. He was more about, um, I think you've even said he was more about survival. Um, right. And, you know, hence the cannibalism. People don't do that just for fun. I mean, I guess some people do. But um, <laughs> did you have any inspirations? Because I've heard that you're actually not a cannibal. Uh, that was kind of disappointing to find out. And that you're actually a pretty nice guy. So what, what inspirations did you have to you know, kind of one, build this character? One of those things may or may not be true. And I think okay. we'll let the audience uh, figure out for themselves. Step um, the cannibalism. I, I, am, I am a uh, I'm reformed, uh, reformed cannibal, dabbled from time to time. No, I, <laughs> dabbled, yeah. I, I will, I will neither Just a little finger here and there. Deny any of that. No, you know, I mean, in terms of like, um, in terms of uh, preparation and, um, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of people have asked me over the years, like, how do you ever get in the mindset of a character like this? And for me, it wasn't about like how you know how would I be okay with with engaging in cannibalism. It was just this this guy was so pragmatic about survival, and it was all you know for Gareth, it was all about divorcing emotion, divorcing any sort of even like moral code from from what it takes and what it means to survive. It was just about 
that's that's what we're gonna that's what we're setting out to accomplish that's what we're setting out to achieve it doesn't really matter what it takes to get there you know um and and some of that is informed by you know we see uh, with some of the brief backstory stuff some of that is informed by what happens to him and his family you know earlier um uh than when we first meet him but so for me it was just about like i could put myself in that mindset you know what i'm gonna do whatever it takes to survive you know it's not it's not about eating people necessarily it's just about it's just about survival it's a little bit about eating people it's a little bit about that but <laughs> you know, look, man, i'll tell you i'll tell you too i on that on the day that we had to shoot the bob's leg scene um we uh they, we were it was we were shooting all night long and the director was like, you know, we want this to be, we, we want to get like close ups and we want to get your fingers and your mouth and chewing and stuff. They brought out the, they brought out this braised pork shoulder, this like big tin of it. Uh, and I swear it was, it was still to this day, it was one of the best meals that I've ever had. <laughs> and it was the easiest thing in the world to, to like sit there and eat that and look like I was really enjoying it because it was just, they set it down, you know, for me and all my, you know, as we call them termites, the, uh, the followers that I had in, in Terminus. And uh, man, we just dug in and had a feast and they filmed it. And then, you know, somehow we had an episode. That was, that was, about, that was about it. Oh my God. Now, first of all, I'm hungry now. Second of all, I have to go back and watch that episode and yeah. just know that that's like, cause I was always wondering like, what is that? Um, obviously, people, you know. Uh, courtesy of uh, Walking Dead Catering. Oh my God. Oh my God. They well, they know how to do it down in the South, you know? Yeah. Maybe. And I've, I've heard you're a big fan of The Wire. I'm actually, and this is embarrassing to say, I, it's one of those shows that has escaped me and I'm getting through it now. I'm like halfway through season two and I'm loving it. And it's oh crazy God. how many Walking Dead actors are on that. I'm so, so jealous of you that you get to have that experience for the first time. <laughs> I know I've watched so many shows it just you know everyone has that one show that you're like I, I just I'm never gonna get to Mad Men or I'm just never gonna get to Friends or whatever it is but uh, The Wire I'm like okay I'm in quarantine I'm gonna watch it but acting alongside Warren I'm proud of you. I'm Chad, proud of you that, you that you're taking this initiative and that you're, that you're getting it done this is a this is a bucket list thing this is a thing listen, that you need to accomplish when quarantine's over everyone's gonna be asking what did you do in quarantine I want to be able to say I finally watched the wire I don't want to say like oh I played a million video games or I just worked the whole time or I went on a bunch of jogs you know I need to have That's something to like hold up and say I did this if you can sit down and watch the wire in its entirety for the first time that might be the single most successful quarantine story I've heard yet you've been more productive and successful than anybody <laughs> just just that's about it well thank you, you so much it, if you can complete it yeah uh i think i can it's it's really really amazing um <laughs> but as i was saying you um you were also a fan of the wire obviously so what was it like acting alongside um chad and lawrence and i think this was was this seth was i think just on at the beginning of season five. Oh, seth was there seth yeah was yeah there. i was i was geeking out every day look i'll tell you I, I didn't, I've never even told Lawrence this, but I'll tell you guys right now. I was so like, just nerd. I was trying to play it so cool when I was working with Lawrence because I was such a massive fan of The Wire. When I got to Atlanta and I, and I started working and, I saw, and then when, when we started season five and I saw that my storyline would be with him, I went back and, and re-binged The Wire like in my apartment in it just because I was so I was like oh my god I am gonna be I'm gonna be working with this guy you know so I actually sat I would be like watching the wire while like going over my scripts and stuff before I was gonna go work with Lawrence and then trying to pump myself up to not be like nervous around him or whatever but he's he's the coolest guy and we we uh you know he made me feel comfortable quickly but yeah no Seth was there um Chad was around you know uh what one of the coolest moments that I actually had on set being the wire fan that I am we had, a, we had a day on set where uh, Chad, Lawrence, and, uh, and Seth were all, were all there in the same scene. I think it was the scene in the church, actually. And I was yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I got to take a picture of the three of them together. And I think Lawrence actually posted that picture recently on his Instagram. And I still was like so, it was like, it was like one of the coolest things for me ever. Just, just to be able to stand there and have those three guys like in frame, you know, while on my phone, like, you know, snapping a photo of them was just... It was just a really cool moment for me but uh 
Yeah, you know, you know, Scott and the rest of the team. Scott was the showrunner at the time when I was on the show. Uh, they they did a pretty good job with casting. You know, they knew they knew what shows to uh, to pick from to to fill out their cast on that show. Yeah, I heard Robert was adamant about casting Chad for Tyrese. He's like, he is Tyrese. Names. He's like, I don't know. I think we'll read for some more people. And he's like, no, listen. He's, you know, I can't confirm that's one hundred percent true, but I, that's what I've heard. So. Um, I, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, I, I couldn't, I, you can't even fathom anybody else playing that role, you know? No, you it, can't. No. Did, did you ask them like wire questions? Did you like fanboy out at all? Or were you just like professional? Like, yeah, so? I tried not to. Yeah, yeah. What's up, man? Just, you know, be, so. be like later on, no big deal. It's all good. <laughs> who, who are you? What's your name? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I didn't really like geek out with them too much, you know, but over the years, like I, I've, uh, I do these conventions for The Walking Dead and they always put Lawrence and I next to each other, you know? Oh. And uh, so, uh, you know, so I've gotten to know him pretty, pretty well over the years. And I, like, I think here and there, you know, I've sort of like ask him some questions or whatever, but yeah, I'd said I was, I was very, I was so, you know, I, cause I just started too. And I was like, I don't want to be that guy. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna play cool. You know, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that Andrew Lincoln is pretty method and he kind of stays in character. Um, so tell me a little bit about that because I am so curious. And now that he's like off the show, he's kind of ascended to this like mythic figure. So <laughs> as he should. He's, yeah, he's, I guess so. He's just sort of evaporated into the ether somewhere. Nobody's quite sure where he is. Uh, he is so method. He is, look, he's, he is the nicest, warmest, most welcoming dude in the world. I love him to death. Um, I had such a great time working with him. He takes his job so seriously and I loved it. But I will say, I think I probably still have like welts on the side of my body from when he was whacking away at me with a rubber machete during the uh, church scene. I think six years later, I'm still healing from that. Um, the guy, he's, he's so uh, committed to what he's doing and he's so intense and he would do this, he would have this like, I don't think he would mind me talking about this. I mean, I loved it. I was I was mesmerized every time I got to work with him. But he had this uh, this sort of like routine that he would go through when when we would do like a really intense scene where he'd almost do, be doing these sort of like to get himself pumped up. It was almost, it almost looked like some sort of bizarre like rain dance and sort of you know like grunts and you know moans. And um, I never even heard his real accent. I think until I went to the rap party because. You know, he stayed in his American accent. All why we'd have lunch together, yeah. and, I, and it would occur to me, you know, like an hour in, like you're still talking like Rick talks, you know. But it, you never, you wouldn't notice because he's so good at it. But I, I really don't think I heard his actual, you know, uh, voice until until uh, the rap party. But um, when we did that church scene, the, it, you know, my death scene, um, the way that we shot that was they gave they gave Andy a. Uh, a Machete, machete that was made out of rubber, hard rubber, okay. Um, <laughs> they wrapped my entire body in padding and you know they were like, look, we want this to look really real, so just go for it. And that was all, that was all Andy Lincoln needed. That was, he, he got the green light and he just wailed away on me. And it was fine. I mean, I was, you know, I, no, no broken ribs that I know of, but, uh, uh, no, I, but I, I was fine. But man, it was, it was terrifying to say the least. Wow. Because he commits 110%. And what, it, you know, the way that it looks on the show, it was even, you know, it was probably double as scary actually in person having that guy actually try to kill you. Um, it's, I, yeah. I just rewatched that scene this morning and it's kind of intense because, like, they like cut to like Tara and like Tyrese and they're seeing like, you know, Sasha and Rick like go ham and it's just like, are we, they're like, wait, are we the villains? Like, this is, this doesn't feel right. This is like, I know that they ate people, but this is like kind of a lot. Oh man, I, t I know. And that's what was so cool about that episode is that it blurred all these lines and suddenly you were like, you know, what, what is okay in this world? What is not okay? What, you know, how do you, um, how do you calibrate any sort of moral compass, you know? And it, and it really, it, it sort of played with the idea of, of heroes and villains and, and, and it complicated things. And that's what was so cool about, about that arc and about, about the show in general. I mean, the show has done it, you know, from the beginning. Um, but no, man, that was gruesome. That was a gruesome, and look, you know, even when we were shooting it, when we were shooting that scene, when we were shooting, especially the uh, uh, premiere of season five with like the trough in the beginning, I remember um, shooting that trough scene in the beginning uh, of the premiere of season five, where 
you know, my henchmen are going across and, and cutting the, the guy's throats. And uh, Nicotero was directing that episode. And I remember going up to him and saying like, man, are we like, are we gonna, is this gonna, how much of this are we gonna see? And he's like, I don't know, man, you know, we're gonna try to get as much as we can. And I remember thinking like, there's no way, there's no way that AMC is gonna show all of this. And they did, you know, they, they really did. And, but it worked, it wasn't, it didn't feel gratuitous. It felt like it was setting up, you know, what was, what was to come in that storyline and, and, and sort of the, the climax of that, of my, of the, my little arc there was what we're talking about, what happened in the church scene. And then that, and then it, and then it, it, it sort of, um, you know, it spun off from there um, in terms of, again, what we were talking about with like, what, what is morally acceptable now? How, how do you, how do you treat people? How, how do you behave um, depending on, on what, other people have done to you what other, how other people are living how they're surviving you know it was complicated and and um and i loved it and it was bloody as hell i, I was i was digging fake blood out of my ear i think for like weeks after that too it was just it was everywhere in like every orifice yeah it was, it was crazy i got in trouble uh just with twitter fans as the walking dead a few years ago because i did a march madness style villain bracket and, you know, it had you and Negan and Alpha and all these people. And I included Rick because he's a villain to everyone that he meets. Right. And, yes. and people were losing their <laughs> shit. And I was like, guys, 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 here's like 20 scenes where he, like, if you are not in his group, you're like, holy shit. These guys yeah, well, are well, let me refer horrifying. You, let me refer you to episode three of season five. Yeah. <laughs> when he just kills a bunch of people in a church. Yeah. <laughs> And like yeah. the, he could have just you know done the whole like head crack thing but no i mean he just he was actually enjoying it a little bit i mean he's really he was going to town. come on let's be real he was enjoying without it. without method you were saying he is i wonder if he like talked to people in cue cards and the love actually like set or <laughs> <laughs> i'd like to think that that carries over in every project he does that definitely you know i definitely uh, earned some points with with my wife getting to work with him she's she's a massive love actually fan so that was that oh was my very gosh anyway, uh, that's <laughs> so um you you said you had a rap party did, was there is that like a death party or um like we had a death party. these like famous dinners it was different yeah no it, it was different we had a death dinner um i had a joint death dinner with lawrence actually uh mm. because you know it we sort of it happened yeah it was the same episode one two two ep uh, one episode difference or whatever but you know and and like obviously the the focus was on Lawrence because he you know he was a bigger character he was on the show longer and stuff but we we had we had sort of a joint dinner we all we all got together and you know they they sent uh they sent the two of us off on our on our merry way uh out of out of Atlanta and away from all the wonderful braised pork shoulder that I've never been able to get my hands on again uh, but, uh, yeah, so we did, we had that and then, uh, and then the rap party was like a separate, you know, it was like a separate thing. I think it was, uh, I think I went to, to I, I went to, I, uh, season four and season five. I think I, I went to both of those, but yeah, but yeah, the death dinner was always, was always nice. I got to, I got to have one of those as well. So it felt special. So after Walking Dead, uh, you, where do you go right from there? Like, I know you had Once Upon a Time, was that in 20... 16, seven, I can't oh, remember wow. when you got. It's scary to think about. Well, yeah, what was that, 15 maybe? Some, it would have been about five years, I think. Um, yeah, you know, that was an interesting time because look, man, like I said, I mean, up to that point, uh, for me, I was just doing the, doing the sort of anonymous actor thing, like, like going into audition rooms and trying to win jobs. And, you know, like I said, doing a couple of pilots that never went and this and that. Uh, when I came off of The Walking Dead, I got to say, for the first time ever, uh, the you know there were there were some incoming calls, which was cool. You know, I just never I it was the first time I was experiencing that. Um, lots of horror movie offers, as you may well imagine. Uh, I think I had probably some cannibal, probably <laughs> some cannibal offers too. They uh, they they had they had heard about my. Uh, um, you know, proclivities, I guess, at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, so I, I was getting some opportunities like that. And then, and then uh, I, I was offered a, I was offered a show, um, a pilot um, based on, you know, coming off of The Walking Dead. And it was very exciting because I'd never, I'd never been the lead on a, on a pilot before. And, and this was the first one. Unfortunately, that one did not go either. Um, so, you know, so I spent, I spent the next like six months to a year 
after the show, like, you know, in this, in this sort of uh, nice, nice spot where, where people, you know, I was sort of getting calls, which was cool. Again, it was the first time that it happened. So, um, you know, but that, that it ebbs and flows and that's the nature of what we do. You know, you, you come off of a show like Walking Dead, suddenly your, your profile is a little bit higher and people want to be working with you and stuff. And I had a nice run and then, you know, you can start to feel it s slow down a little bit and then you're kind of going back to the grind and you're auditioning and you're doing your thing. Um, and then the next, the next big job to come along after that, you know, I'd done some films that, that I was proud of and that I really liked. Um, but after that was uh, Once Upon a Time. When I started, uh, when I started working on Once Upon a Time, that's fantastic. That must have been a wild ride. I mean, they like The Walking Dead have a rabid fan base. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, it's like, but it's crazy because it's it's so it's equally as rabid, but it's like it's such a different demographic. You know, it's like it's like fairy, you know, the fairy tales. And yeah, it's a little different, little different yeah, than than. than you know, Rick uh, shooting a, a little girl zombie in the head in, in episode one of, uh, of the entire series. A little different vibe for once. Fun. People aren't giving you body parts to sign in that fandom? No, not so much. Not Does so that much. happen, by the way? I just made that up. Is that a thing? Oh, my God. Yes. Okay, good. Thank well, God. I don't, I, hopefully none of them were actually real body As far as I could tell, they were not real, all the ones I signed. Uh, I, I, uh, It'd be fantastic if it was. Uh, what a story. You know, you never know, but uh, no, man. With the, I've I've get some weird stuff to sign at the conventions, and and plenty of like severed rubber legs and feet and stuff like that. Oh yeah, that's that's a that's a fan favorite for uh, to have Gareth sign. Absolutely. Wow. Um, I mean, my my action figure comes with like a burnt carcass for God's sake. So, <laughs> like, you know, I used to think like Gareth was like too far gone, and even if he survived, it would be hard to sort of redeem him. But they're currently trying to redeem Negan. And you were kind of like Negan before Negan, because you know you had you had your own sanctuary. You had like a bunch of people who were following you, not as many, but still a lot. You know, you had some pretty twisted ways of like justice, but they're now trying to make him like cool with kids and dogs and stuff. So it's like Negan you know, I think Gareth. I like it. I don't know. Negan prototype, poor man's Negan. You know, I, I'll take it. I'll take. I it. wouldn't say that. Precursor. Um, Negan. Negan would not. Resort, Negan would not eat another human. He does not have the stomach for that. So <laughs> that sort of depravity. He eats like pancakes. That, yeah, even that is beyond uh, is beyond Negan. Yeah, no, I mean it's a good look. Look, that it would have been quite a job to 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 redeem Gareth, and I don't know if they, if they could have pulled it off. But it goes to show, like you know, and anything may be possible in this world. You, you, they're they're uh, they're le they're at least attempting to to make it happen with Negan. Uh, so yeah, maybe there was still hope for Gareth if he had just stuck around. You know, him and Bob could have become friends if they had both survived. They could have made he could have he could have he could have uh, you know somehow uh, manufactured a, a, a fake leg. I don't know. I don't know what it would have taken. I mean, Herschel made it work. You might as well. Um, yeah, right. Come on. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, Marvel has their what-if series, so maybe someday there will be a Walking Dead what-if series Ooh. so we can see that play out. I would love that. Mm -hmm. um, so what, I know we're all like, everyone's life is kind of on pause and everything, but uh, what other projects do you have coming up? Yeah, man, well, I was lucky. Um, I wrapped a job, I think, literally uh, that two weeks before, before the shutdown, before we all went into quarantine. Uh, yeah, I did. The, I did this really cool film, and, and um, one of the most exciting things about it was uh, it's actually it was actually set in sh and shot in Indiana, in my home state. Mm -hmm. um, it's this film called So Cold the River. Uh, it's based on a Michael Carita novel. Uh, Michael Carita is an absolutely fantastic writer. Uh, uh, he's, he, I mean, he's, I think he's got like 20 novels under his belt at this point, and uh, most of them at this point are either in the works to be adapted or, or have already been adapted. And uh, this is, he's an Indiana guy, he's a Hoosier as well, and he wrote this novel that was set uh, in West Baden Springs in this historic hotel in, in southern Indiana. And um, I was lucky enough to get cast in, in this film, and it's this really cool sort of psychological thriller with some supernatural you know, overtones, um, but we shot in this historic hotel in Southern Indiana. Um, the entire cast and crew stayed at the hotel. They shut it down for us. And uh, we had this really amazing experience over the winter 
Um, and luckily, luckily, we got this thing in like right at the buzzer, you know, before everything happened. So, um, you know, they're, they're in editing on that and, and, uh, and I'm very excited for that to come out. Hopefully we'll be seeing that early next year, you know, but it's so hard to know right now, man. You know, it's like, it's so tough to know what the next, uh, you know, six months or a year is going to look like. Um, but, but otherwise, uh, yeah, you know, everything is, you know, we're kind of at a standstill, but like I said, I, I've, I've, I've already been, uh, approached about about these different projects that are like corona proof or either about what's going on now or corona proof in that they're trying to find ways to you know get people to shoot stuff in their houses and you know on their own and without crews it's crazy so i don't know what's going to happen but um but yeah but i am very excited about that film it's called so cold the river so um so that's the next i can't wait to see it thanks bud it's going to be really cool it's uh yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped um yeah very very cool indeed that's awesome. Before we wrap up, I saw that on your Instagram, you have some paintings that are oh. pretty remarkable. Did, uh, dumb question. Did you paint those? I did. I did. Those yeah. They're amazing. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's something that I, that I started playing around with uh, about 10 years ago. And honestly, it was the thing, you know, in, in between jobs, you know, way back 10, 11 years ago, kind of when I first started, um, I'd have these periods in between jobs where I just needed some sort of hobby or creative outlet or whatever. And I, and I started playing around with, uh, with oil paints and, um, you know, it was, it was a long road to kind of figure out what I was doing because it's such a complicated medium. And, and I was, you know, essentially self taught. I, I just never kind of, you know, took a class or whatever. And then I would, I would work and I would go for long periods where I wasn't able to paint. But, um, Turns out quarantine life is very good for, for getting some painting done. So that's been, you know, I, I've been spending my time uh, back in the studio quite a bit um, when, I, when I'm not hanging with my baby girl. So that's sort of what I've been, what I've been doing. Yeah. It, when did you discover you had that talent? Sorry, I, I know we're supposed to be leaving, but I am so yeah, interested because I, I was looking for Instagram and I'm like, holy crap. No, you should see my early painting. There was no talent. There is there's no- <laughs> They're just like stick people. figures. <laughs> This was, uh, it was bad. I like, I look back at those early paintings from like 10 years ago and I asked my wife, like, how did you let me continue doing this? These are, these are terrible, but no, it was just a very slow process of, of like working at it and learning the medium and just, and just really trying to get better. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's been a, I've got a long way to go too, but it's, it's just, um, you know, I really enjoy it and I really love it. And even if you're not that great at something, if you have that passion, you can kind of, you know, apply yourself and, and slowly it, you kind of make that uphill climb. And before you know it, you've got something that does, that looks half, halfway decent. So, uh, dude, it's no, it's legit. It's really good. Um, I, so I, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, I love portraiture. I, I love painting portraiture and, uh, I love, uh, I love figurative and, and realist art. And as far as like what, you know, the stuff that I like to paint, but, um, but yeah, it's been great, man, to be able to have the opportunity, you know, over this past two months, especially to be able to get back in the studio regularly. So it's kind of how I've been trying to spend my time. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And yeah. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's, you're one of my favorite Walking Dead characters. So it's great to talk to the guy behind the character oh, and uh, get to know you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Tell the people before we go where they can follow you on social media and see these amazing paintings. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you want to find me on Instagram, you can go to at Andrew J. West. Uh, Twitter is at A-N-D-J. West. And uh, yeah, we'll be, uh, you know, posting some updates about the film that'll be coming out. And uh, and yeah, my my tinkering in the studio, some, some of the ones that, that will see the light of day may those feeds as well too not not all of them make it many many uh go into the trash heap but some of them some of them make the cut so well you're very talented and i appreciate you taking the time enjoy quarantine excited to watch your movie next year and oh, thank um, you so much. hopefully we'll having. have you on again sometime i would love that really thank you for for letting me be a part of it absolutely thanks andrew have a good one man you have a good one thank you all right see ya And that was my interview with Andrew J. West. Uh, you know, if I was an actor, I would probably do Johnny R. Odell. I really love the middle initial. It, it really kind of gives you hmm. some oomph as an actor, you know? What, what would yours be, Alexandra August? Alexandra M. August. Eh. Alexandra M. August.
I'm kind of I, I would like something interesting like Alexandra Q August or something like that. I'd go I'd go with a rare letter one cool. you don't one you don't see every day. We're gonna go on to a little uh, segment before we wrap up called Stray Arrows. These are some observations that we had that didn't fit into a segment. Um, I'm going to start us off. I think Chris Coy, who played Martin, knocked it out of the park this episode. It wasn't anything like overly emotional. He was just one of the most realistically written characters I've seen on the show. Mm -hmm. And it was sad to see him go. I mean, he was a villain, but like the way, just the way that Scott Gimple wrote him was just like a normal guy. He's like, why are you even talking to me, bro? Take the gas, take the kid, get the fuck out of here. Forget Terminus, just go. Just, I like that in this episode, and we've come across this in a lot of episodes that we've done on Reanimated in the first couple of seasons, because this is sort of when it's here and in this season, season five moving up that we really see the survivors decide on a workable philosophy and how to live their life it's we see it a little bit earlier in this episode when glenn's like yo we gotta let those people out that's what we do now that's important um and you see the other side of that with martin sitting in this cabin being like listen i have made my bed i'm just trying to lie in it could you please take the baby and the car and get the fuck out of here so i don't have to kill you because i really i just have a lot to do today and right. I ca- yeah, like it was just, it was sort of, he was just an example of like, guys, there's a clear choice. Once you've made the choice, move on with your life. And uh, um, one final thing, yeah. um, Terminus walked so Negan's sanctuary could run. I mean, I, yeah. I would have loved for Gareth to survive just to like exchange, <laughs> you know, notes and recipes with Negan to be like, oh, the walker fence. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. And then Negan being yeah, like, yeah. oh yeah, these like, you know, these maps to our place, you know, you put like miles and miles out. Great idea. That's a... That's a good that's good thinking that saves us on supply missions. I see you on the bat there too. I like I mean I got that said though. I like I like a wooden bat, you know. There were there's a reason metal bats were not used in pro baseball. Gareth being like, "Ooh, iron to the face. Good idea." Like I just would have loved like a conversation with like with them. That would have been fantastic. Um what are uh your stray arrows? Uh, I think what we 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 mentioned before, just the killer foreshadowing in Bats and Glenn's head, uh, was going to be one of my pocket tips to just be like, if you see a bat, just get out of there or grab yes. it, make it your weapon, um, and also just the sh- the um, you know this is a Greg Nicotero episode because it features just a lot of wonderful gratuitous very artful gore that's disgusting and scary and wonderful yes. um and i i um, i'm i'm citing the like human slaughterhouse that was where most of this episode took place to the point where you get like there's just, like rick bob daryl and glenn escape the little escape the little trough and then run into this room next door and just stand there for a minute and look at the hanging corpse the hanging like oh, human bodies yeah, talk about being a butcher. Holy crap, that was crazy. Like, they were not fucking around. Someone no. someone at Terminus had worked in meatpacking before and knew exactly what they were doing. Oh, my um, God. It was yeah. really, that image stays with me to this day. Like, now I know what a human would look like in that situation, which I feel like I shouldn't know. Uh, and then my last one is, and this is more of a question. This is a question for everyone um, and a question for you, Johnny. Ooh. Did you ever believe when you were first watching this and maybe... I don't know if you're the best person to ask, but did you ever believe when you were first watching this that Eugene actually had a cure before we found out that he didn't? I did, yeah. Uh, no, I was a stupid dum dum like everyone else. I really did think oh. that he he did, and um, I mean, I had my doubts, but because I was like, ah, does he? Does he not? I don't know. Like, I was skeptical for sure, but I was like, well, there's probably something to it. I mean, but yeah. Then he says something in this episode where. He it was very robotic where he's like, well, I have the cure. And Abraham is like, and that is why I'm protecting you. And Rosita's like, same. I am also protecting you because of this thing you promised us. And I was like, oh, uh, wait a minute. So this is the episode where I was like, uh, I don't know about this. I remember wanting to believe it and being like, oh, this is an interesting turn for this story to take. And really, really, really just wanting there to be something. Because I think one of the reasons that The Walking Dead is so distinctive is that there's this just kind of, there's a hopelessness that permeates the series in terms of every, anything going back to the way it was. It's, I think the comics and the show make it very clear, um, especially with when you, once you find out um, what, uh, what, CDC man whispers into Rick's ear about how everyone is a carrier and this is all this is just happening there is 
at some point, like you, pretty early on, the comics in the show make it very clear that like, hi, this is how the world is now, right. and this is how it's going to be. So it's like, even if these people like. What these people are fighting for is a chance to survive. It's not like getting back to a nice house with the internet and like a fun time and trips to the Cayman Islands once every couple of years. The standards for your the the standards are now low for what makes a happy life. And the idea that Eugene could come around and be like, no, there's a cure made me personally feel like, oh, oh, that would be oh, that'd be kind of neat. That would not, that would sort of like change the goalposts a little bit. And then I think around, after a while, I was like, this feels way too good to be on brand for The Walking Dead. All right, well, that wraps up this week's episode of Talk Dead to Me. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Woody continues to be on paternity leave. Um, He will be back in a few short weeks. So if you don't like uh, listening to just me and Alexandra, well, you can just uh, go fuck yourself. I'm kidding. Just wear a mask while you do that. Yeah, (laughs) I saw that article. That was crazy. All right. Uh, with that, uh, as always, happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. And happy birthday, Nate, from Woody. Yeah, I saw that article where uh, the CDC is recommending if you're going to have sex, do it with a mask on. And it's like, joke's on you, CDC. I've been doing that for years. <laughs> Hashtag gimp life. Just kidding. <laughs>